The Gemini program is one of our favorite programs, but we haven't covered it nearly enough. So today we're talking to Michael Mikowski, who's a bit of a Gemini expert, all about the Lost Gemini missions. What's your favorite Lost Gemini mission? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram, Threads, and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash Space and Things. But right now, Enjoy episode 151 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. Unbelievable. You're listening to the Space and Things podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 151 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. Doing good. How are you doing over there? Not too bad. Not too bad. So I see that you've uh, started properly now at Space 3.0. I'm pretty sure I saw a post about a a mailing list for a bi-weekly newsletter. Is that correct? Yes. um, Let me just put that out there. Um, The Space 3.0 Foundation, which I'm the manager of public engagement and social media for, we used to have a newsletter, but we have started a new bi-weekly newsletter. It's going to have a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, It's curated by me, It'll have a lot of cool space history type links, a lot of neat, diverse things for you to get into. Also, a little bit of information about Space 3.0 Foundation and what we do and the kind of services that we offer as well. So if you're interested, it is free of no cost to you at all. So you can sign up for free, get it every two weeks. The place to sign up is spacecommerce.org slash get dash involved. That's the URL if you're interested, in, and I'm sure we'll have it in the show notes as well. So you just go to that website, go to Mission Mail, and you just sign up there. Easy as that. And, and it's free. And I know we all love free stuff, especially me. So <laughs> yeah. go sign up. <laughs> exactly. Free stuff is always good. Yeah. So what's the plan for the newsletter then? Will it be exclusive interviews with some people we know, or how's it going to work? Yes. Well, my new role at this organization, like I said, I'm the manager of public engagement and social media. So I'm kind of slowly getting started. I I need to establish um, sort of a content calendar for some of the things that I want to put out there publicly or that we want to put out there publicly, I should say. Some of the things that I'm going to do and I'm currently working on uh, for Space 3.0 is we're doing exclusive uh, interviews. Uh, They may appear in Quest Magazine or elsewhere, but uh, I've done a couple interviews. I don't want to spoil who it is, but I've already done a couple interviews with some space history legends, so they will be out soon. If you're not familiar with Quest Magazine, it is, I believe, $29.99 a year, and if I think if you get two years, it's 50 bucks, so you actually save $10. It actually does cost money. However, if you guys love space history... You got to invest in this magazine. It's awesome. I get it. I, I'm not just saying it as somebody who works at the company that puts it out, but personally, it's it's awesome. I have a lot of the issues archived for my you know personal consultation. If you love space history, it's really an indispensable resource. So I would get it. So I'm hoping these interviews either we'll we'll put them out maybe as an audio thing. Or we might put them in Quest. And I'm currently working on a couple of them. And I don't want to spoil who it is, but they're big space history legend. So I I think you all will uh, enjoy it a lot. Excellent. Let's get on with this week's main feature. So when our Patreon subscriber, Toby Jeffries, made a spreadsheet of our covered topics and he broke it all down into uh, different sub-genres of topics, which was really useful. He did this for us a couple of months ago. It became apparent that despite it being one of our favourite programmes, we really haven't spent enough time talking about Project Gemini. I say Gemini, Emily says something else, which is wrong. Anyway, (laughs) in fact, (laughs) we've only ever produced one episode dedicated to the Gemini programme, which was episode 93. And within that episode, we talked about the highlights of the programme and why we love it so much. So if you don't know anything about the Gemini programme, maybe go and listen to that episode first. Within that episode, Emily and I mentioned that there were some other plans made for the Gemini spacecraft, which were obviously never realised, but would have been amazing to see. In fact, 
These have been the subject of many alternative history fiction pieces, which obviously I mean, I, Emily and I love as well. For those of you who really don't know anything about the Gemini program, it's a two-person spacecraft which had 10 crewed missions between 1965 and 1966 and allowed NASA to learn all the skills required to perform the Apollo program. That's like the most basic definition of the Gemini program I could think of. To do this, we're joined by Michael Mikowski, who joined us back on episode 76 to talk about building model spacecraft. If you listen to that episode, then you may remember that Mike started his engineering career at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. And McDonnell Douglas built the Gemini spacecraft. (laughs) Yes, Gemini spacecraft. A few years earlier, He saved a lot of documentation from the dumpsters, and his first managers were the guys who designed and built the spacecraft. Now, Mike has spent a lot of time researching Gemini and these lost missions of Gemini. He has even written a paper for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, which was released in January 2021. I'm a member of that association, and they're pretty awesome, too. So this is a topic we have wanted to cover for a while, and we couldn't think of a better person to talk with about it. So let's get on with the interview. Past to present, Sputnik to Starship. This is Space and Things. Hello, Mike. Welcome back to Space and Things. So first of all, let's set the scene for the Gemini program. What necessitated a two-person program and what things set it apart from Mercury other than just having a second astronaut? Well, in the early days of the United States sending people to the moon, you know, the initial program was just figuring out what a person could do in orbit in space. So that was the primary goal of the uh, one one man Mercury program. But they soon realized that uh, with Apollo's capabilities and requirements for rendezvous, landing, changing your orbit, in orbit maneuvering, extravehicular activity, and Apollo wasn't going to be ready for a while. They needed an intermediate program to test out and develop, develop all those technologies. So McDonald proposed a two-man Mercury capsule, which uh, became Gemini with those additional capabilities, which would be required to complete the lunar mission. Right. So that, that timeline is definitely Apollo was approved before Gemini. Yes. I, I think they had some initial idea that something was going to be needed. But if you recall, even the Apollo block one didn't have any docking capability. Right. Uh, And and that was the block two upgrade. So the initial, actually, even the initial design for Apollo uh, didn't assume the uh, lunar orbit rendezvous approach. It it, it didn't have docking and the the service propulsion system on the service module was big enough to actually take the whole thing to the surface and back, mm. and which is why it, it's so oversized. And and so a lot of decisions were made before they even had the whole architecture worked out. Uh-huh. So with with that initial assumptions, they realized, hey, we're we missing some intermediate step here. Uh, so Gemini came along to fill those needs while Apollo was being developed. So the Gemini spacecraft was known for being uh, more maneuverable than its predecessor. Uh, so what contributed to this and could this have given, uh, Gemini perhaps a longer life than it had, you know, doing other kinds of space missions? Well, it did have, it, it, it had that in orbit maneuverability because that was needed to develop and prove out rendezvous and docking techniques, which the Mercury capsule had none of those capabilities. And that was a completely new and untested uh, way of flying spacecraft. And so that was a requirement for the Gemini mission, Gemini spacecraft design to have in orbit propulsion and orbit change capabilities to, to practice rendezvous and docking. Um, and that enabled it to have a lot of capability for other missions. So absolutely it, it could have led to other applications. And, and as we'll see, as the discussion goes on, there were a lot of other applications proposed for the Gemini capsule. So yeah, let's let's get get stuck into them because I do find this fascinating that actually this spacecraft was designed and we got two years out of it, but there were so many other plans that, for it that didn't take place. And I love that. So including a lunar Gemini concept. So what were the other Gemini concepts? Uh, that that could have worked or would have been interesting in your opinion? 
If you look at the official history of Gemini and some of the original source documentation, you see the original purpose of it was for it to be a general purpose crewed spacecraft. It could do a lot of different things. And of course, it achieved that uh, and, and filled that role for the Apollo missions. But it had all these other capabilities. So in the early 60s, when folks were looking at other space programs besides going to the moon, if you look at a lot of these old illustrations, you keep seeing Gemini spacecraft popping up. Yeah. It's, they're all over the place in various concepts that never got off the ground. But there were a lot of them that actually did make some progress. So let's talk about some, and I can kind of categorize some. There are some proposals for lunar missions. Uh, the U.S. Air Force and the military had ideas for using Gemini. And there were a uh, whole plethora of space station type concepts, both for NASA and the, the military that used Gemini as a logistics spacecraft. And then there's a bunch of other miscellaneous ones. In the early 60s, like 61, Apollo was still kind of uh, uncertain. They were having development problems and they were concerned about the Russians beating us. So there were actual studies done. Hey, if we had to, could we use a Gemini to get to the moon before the Russians? Because Apollo wasn't going to be ready for a while. And this is before even, you know, Mercury just started flying. So they were, they were looking at this early in the early 60s, the Air Force trying to figure out what military crew could do in space. Uh, they had a kind of a problem. They didn't know what the crew could do, what they were capable of, and they didn't know what they needed to do. So, you know, right. they didn't have real requirements and they didn't know what their capabilities were. So it was kind of a mess, but they figured, look, we need more than a one person spacecraft in orbit for a few hours to figure this out. We need a couple of guys up there in a big lab for a few weeks, and then we'll maybe learn something. So the Air Force had a lot of studies on small manned space stations and mostly all of them, some didn't, but most of them used a Gemini capsule as a logistics vehicle. Some of those evolved then into the manned orbiting lab, which was a, a ostensibly a research lab, but in reality, a giant reconnaissance platform. They actually cut hardware for that, spent a lot of money. And when unmanned spacecraft uh, robotic surveillance systems got more capable and the, uh, the MOL program with the crew got ex more expensive. They decided we'll just go with the, with the robotic spy satellites and that was canceled. But that one became very close to, um, seeing flight system, but there are other smaller ones. And the whole story of the evolution of early Air Force space station studies that led to manned orbiting lab is very fascinating. And still has a lot of gaps in it because a lot of stuff is uh, the source documents are lost or classified. Mm. I've got a Freedom of Information Act request in for over a year trying to get wow. reports from these early studies and they're nice. dragging their heels. But <laughs> um, there's some potentially interesting stories there. I'm trying to dig into them. Uh, there are other things like using Gemini for satellite inspection. Uh, later on, there was other lunar Gemini uh, studies. There was a NASA-sponsored manned orbiting research lab, kind of a pre-Skylab space station study, and it needed logistics vehicles. It was going to be permanent. It was going to be resupplied. What do you have to resupply things? Oh, well, we can't use Apollo. They're busy going to the moon. We'll launch Gemini spacecraft. Of course, Gemini was designed with no docking, so that was kind of funny. Or not funny, but uh, a challenge. But McDonnell Douglas by that time, actually still McDonnell, they had contracts to study ferry versions. It was, a, it was a, I think it was actually called Gemini Ferry Spacecraft, a manned orbiting research lab contract. They thought of sending Gemini to the moon to do lunar orbit for photographic reconnaissance before Apollo. This was when the robotic spacecraft, if you recall, Ranger and Surveyor didn't, weren't successful on the first couple of tries. Yeah. So they were worried, oh my gosh, we're not going to get photos. Let's maybe send people there. It's more reliable. You know, eventually uh, the lunar orbiter program was successful in getting images back, but they considered sending a Gemini for this. So there's all sorts of proposals for using this design because it was so capable. It had so many capabilities. It demonstrated, you know, almost two weeks of endurance in low Earth orbit. So it could do these extended missions. And there was all sorts of stuff done in the early first half of the 60s. 
Was there much discussion about safety? Because obviously, as we know, going to the moon on an Apollo spacecraft was crazy enough. And obviously, they needed a lifeboat on Apollo 13, as we know. And the Gemini spacecraft wouldn't have had any kind of facility like that, as I'm aware. Or, or was that factored into these mission plans? Or did they ne- ne- not get to that stage? The lunar capable Gemini designs were upgraded. They had to add uh, extra communications equipment, different navigation equipment, uh, better computer. They had to beef up the uh, heat shielding for lunar velocity cool. return and reentry. There already was, you know, as much redundancy as Apollo. I think one of the ideas was after the Apollo fire, they looked at Gemini again for a uh, lunar rescue concepts, and they had quite a self-funded study by McDonnell in in the late 60s for this. So there was various phases of lunar Gemini being considered. And I think the Apollo 1 fire triggered this because it's thought, well, what if there's a mission to the moon and there's some problem? You don't want to send another Apollo because it might have the same failure mode. So send a Gemini with different systems that won't have the same failure mode. And they actually studied that for uh, lunar rescue options. The, the other question that, that really comes to mind when, when I'm hearing about this and all these different ideas of what you could do with the Gemini program is is cost. I don't know if cost is one of the reasons why this didn't happen, but when we talk about spacecraft now, it's all in terms of, well, this would have been so much cheaper than Apollo and uh, or more expensive and the shuttle was this and, that and this, that and the other. Was Gemini on the whole considered a cheap spacecraft to, to build and, and operate or... Or, or, or where did it fit on the scale of, of costings? That's a good question. I, I don't, in the studies that I've researched, there wasn't a lot of depth gone into the cost. They weren't trying to compare the cost versus Apollo. Uh, a lot of these were proposed because it was not a Gemini versus Apollo because Apollo was sort of untouchable. It was a dedicated go to the moon, don't mess with it. Right. So that kind of meant we're not even to consider using an Apollo. So there was no cost comparison. These were mostly alternate uses for Gemini. As long, as long as we have Gemini, let's keep using it. You know, we know what it does. We know it can work. We know its capabilities. We'll keep using it. It wasn't so much that uh, these other ideas were too costly to implement. It's just that as a program themselves, there was never going to be enough funding no matter what the design looked like. Uh, actually, even some of these early Air Force studies had a had a X twenty dinosaur as the logistics vehicle, huh, right. uh, and that was compared uh, X twenty dinosaur versus Gemini, and it was just the whole rationale of the program. And I think what it was is the program couldn't get funded. It wasn't so much that Gemini was cheap or affordable or expensive. It just as a, having an additional program like. Um, early space stations, those programs just never got enough traction to get funding. Okay. So another, you, you've talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, another Gemini concept was flown, but did not enter service with astronauts, which was the manned orbiting laboratory where a hole was actually cut through the heat shield to make a hatch to go to a space station. So Tell us a little more about this, its lone test flight, and, and why was it canceled? Well, this was um, about as far as manned orbiting lab program got. They did have a test flight with a, a Titan III. The capsule was a standard Gemini with the uh, hatch and the heat shield. It actually, I believe, was a suborbital or partial orbital mission to get an orbital velocity reentry, and, and that was recovered. The hatch and the heat shield worked just fine. Actually, the heat shield fused over the uh, hatch opening on reentry, which was, uh, you know, a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, the the heat shield hatch was actually proposed by McDonald in some of these earlier studies. They had uh, small space station concepts, and uh, the Air Force. Uh, small space station studies as well. Uh, they all assumed a hatch in the heat shield for access. And there was even some rather clever docking concepts McDonald came up with, kind of a 
uh, imagine two forks with just two tines approaching each other and you, you, you put them at 90 degree angles, they kind of could glide into each other and dock. They had a set of four of these, actually it was a fork and ring. One side of the spacecraft had four two-tined forks and the other side had like a circular ring and you would, you would just, you know, have a rough alignment, you dock and they would sort of self-align and, uh, you would, you'd be able to dock spacecraft that way. You would back into it and you'd have a little docking station in the rear of the Gemini with another modified adapter. But, uh, manned orbiting lab got that far. The lab portion actually went into orbit, but it was just a dummy shell. Uh, they did start building uh, some hardware, but again, this program never got any further because costs kept going up and the, uh, the robotic reconnaissance spacecraft were doing so well that at this point there didn't seem to be a lot of uh, need to add a crew which would add to the complications and cross that cost. You have to remember in the early 60s, when a lot of this stuff, these ideas started, uh, satellites didn't last very long. You put a satellite up, and if you got a couple of months out of it, that was great. Mm. And so in the early 60s, you have to remember, the stuff kept breaking. The life was short. It was all new, was poorly understood. So the assumption was, well, we'll need to have space stations up there with repair stations because you know, these satellites are going to break all the time. So we need a, a uh, orbiting service station for astronauts to go up there and fix these satellites. That's why we need a space station to keep satellites fixed. Well, what happened was the satellites got better and they last for years. And so now you don't have that argument for astronauts up there anymore. Same thing with the reconnaissance satellites. You know, you get a month or so of data and you drop a capsule down with the film. But, you know, you're just shooting in the blind. You don't know if it's cloudy over your target. Put a crew up there. You can now determine, hey, should I take a picture or not? Oh, it's cloudy. We'll take it on the next orbit. But later, as time went on, they got weather. You know, that's why the military has weather satellites to see if it's clear or cloudy to take pictures. And the, the robotic reconnaissance satellites got smarter and more capable. And by the time uh, the manned orbiting lab program was going a few years. It was like, eh, is this really a good idea? I don't know. It's really costing us a lot. And eh, never mind. <laughs> How much of this stuff got prototyped or or, or made? I I think I was at the Air and Space Museum in in uh, the one just outside the, the Smithsonian one just outside DC, and they had the winged Gemini, maybe some. some or they ha maybe am I imagining that? I'm sure they had a pro maybe a prototype of some wings somewhere in one of the air and space museums I've been to, and and in the Dayton, Ohio Air, air Force Museum they've got the manned orbiting uh, laboratory test. Mm -hmm. uh, Gemini, yep. is, is there much of this stuff around or not? There, there really wasn't much that got into hardware. These were all a lot of paper studies. Uh, the Wing Gemini is an interesting example. We, we, I started my career as an engineer at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. My first managers and engineering bosses were the guys who developed the electrical system for the Mercury and Gemini capsules. So I, I you know, when I was a young engineer, I was hanging around there and I'm just like, oh my God, these guys are awesome. You know, <laughs> and to be in the buildings where those were built and tested and the library had all sorts of documentation. But over time, you know, that was old hat and okay, we're done with that. Hey guys, it's Friday. Why don't you spend a half an hour cleaning out your file cabinets? Get rid of some of this paper. We need room for desks and get rid of some of these file cabinets. So after they all left, I go dumpster diving and pull stuff out of the trash. <laughs> and one of the things I pulled out of the trash was a couple of charts. It was called Wing Gemini. And I was like, what the heck is this? Uh, there's another program McDonald did in the early 60s called Asset. It was a hypersonic reentry vehicle development for the Air Force. It was actually done as a materials research project in support of the X-20 dinosaur program. So it had that kind of flat bottom pointy nose shape and it was done to uh, develop materials and aerothermodynamics for hypersonic reentry vehicles like the X-20. Well, what they did was they took that Asset shape, it's like a Gemini capsule on it, and proposed it to the Air Force. And at first, all I found was these two sheets. 
And I had no idea because it didn't make any sense. You know, what, why, you, what kind of mission would this be? They had a, a re-entry nose cap on the nose of the Gemini. So there's no room for a rendezvous radar. So you can't do rendezvous. You're not going to do satellite inspection. There's no docking. You messed up the rare where the hatch would be. Years later, one of my buddies, he found on, on one of the NASA technical research NTRS websites, a paper on this under the asset program. And it was actually proposed several years later as a crude hypersonic flyable research vehicle. A few years after X-20 was canceled to test out flying capabilities of pilots in a suborbit. Actually, it was going to do three orbits and then re-enter. So it was just pure aero research, but it never got past paper set. So a lot of this stuff, the whole story is kind of hard to find because I only had a piece of it for years and it took a while to find anything on it. And that's the same with a lot of these other ones, but very little of it actually got past the paper study phase because they proposed this. Uh, sometimes they were funded studies. NASA or the Air Force would give McDonald's, some of the other contractors, some funds to do something. A lot of them were internally funded by McDonald. Hey, we can sell more Gemini capsules. What do you <laughs> think about this, guys? It's a sale this week. Buy two, get one free, you know, <laughs> uh, but there was never enough extra funding to do these side projects. Anything that wasn't involved with getting to the moon before the Russians was like secondary, tertiary. It wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. I, I just realized the thing that I saw at uh, the Adva Hazy Center was the the paraglider capsule. Uh, yes. The, 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 the Rogala wing recovery uh concept yes yes that that's what they have there P pretty crazy stuff that they've got out there anyway was there ever uh, another launch vehicle proposed or designed for the gemini spacecraft because obviously it was stuck on top of uh the intercon intercontinental ballistic missile that was yeah. the titan but any anything else ever proposed for it no, because not not that I've ever seen. The Titan worked great for, for the NASA missions. There were some alternate, just like scientific advanced missions for Gemini would go up on a, a same Titan. Some of the other ones, like the manned orbiting lab, we carried a Titan three with the side boosters. Uh, some of the lunar missions assumed a Saturn one type launcher just because there was extra mass for a lander or a rescue right. compartment. They actually had to stretch the capsule. If you're going to bring back a crew, you fly two Gemini astronauts and then you have to have room for three Apollo astronauts. So they actually had a stretch capsule. And that the, the other thing that actually got into hardware, at least a mock-up, McDonald built a full-scale mock-up of something called Big G or Big <laughs> Gemini. It was going to be the logistics vehicle for some of these mid 1960s space stations. Ideally, NASA wanted a reusable winged re-entry vehicle, which turned into the shuttle. But that was going to take a while to develop. McDonald said, hey, we can make a giant version of Gemini, and you can use that for your space stations until your shuttle is ready. And they built a full-scale mock-up of that and did a bunch of, um, you know, human factor studies. You know, how many guys can fit in there? Can they get it and out? You know, how would you land this thing? And even that was going to be landed with the skids, with the giant Rogalo flyable landing gear, landing wing on a, on a, on a runway instead of dropping 12 guys in the ocean. Did that survive or did that get mothballed or, or pulled apart? I don't know for a fact, but that's a good question. I assume it got scrapped. I believe it was just a wooden mock-up, but there's lots of pictures of it and there's a lot of documentation. You know, they got contracted studies for Big G. So that documentation is floating around. Of course, I've built models of a whole bunch of these. <laughs> of course. Which is why I'm doing the research. But yeah. it's, it's turning into a real project. And I, I keep finding more stuff, more bizarre space station studies and other things. I did write a paper on it for a technical conference. And I wanted to try to do some analysis, like answer the question, why did none of these get funded? You know, what was really behind that? Sure, it's cool to collect all these stories, but, you know, a, a few got part way, like manned orbiting lab, why, why didn't any of these things go on? And you have to look at it in context to what else is going on. So for all these, you have to look at it in context with, with the Apollo program, with uh, the X-20 program, with military reconnaissance programs, with other unmanned reconnaissance programs. So you have to look at it not in isolation. As you study history, you have to look at 
you know, whatever topic you're looking at, but to see what else is going on that's related to this. Because a lot of the Gemini applications that I'm looking at were alternates or adjuncts or add-ons to existing programs or different ways of doing existing programs, like different ways of doing hypersonic aerodynamics, different ways of doing orbital reconnaissance, different ways of doing space station, all based on using the Gemini technology. Why didn't any of them get picked up? Largely, again, because there wasn't enough money for new programs. This was alternate, a different way of doing things that they were already doing. And those customers were, you know, satisfied with how those were going. Or if a problem came up and say, McDonald's says, hey, you can use Gemini to solve your problem. And they look at it and say, ah, we'll spend the money on fixing the problem. Thanks, guys. See you later. Uh, so so there, you have to look at the whole picture. And, and I've tried to do that. Finally, the Gemini program, in our view, is overlooked probably because it was between uh, Mercury and Apollo and, and was really short-lived. It didn't fly for, uh, it only flew for less than two years. What do you think the Gemini legacy is? And do you wish it could have flown beyond 1966? I think the main legacy of Gemini is it developed the technologies that Apollo needed to get to the moon and back. Without Gemini, you wouldn't know how to do EVA. You wouldn't know how to do rendezvous and docking. You wouldn't know the problems of long duration spaceflight. You wouldn't have the logistics of flying two vehicles. You know, they had a uh, Gemini and a Gina. Uh, they had Gemini six and seven at the same time. So you had mission control, learned a lot because they had to have two crews up there at the same time. Without those programs, without those two years of successful Gemini missions, you wouldn't put Apollo on the moon. Mm. And what I, oh, I would love to have seen more stuff. I mean, you know, manned orbiting lab, sure, single use for a lab, but that, that would have led to something. The lunar missions were kind of, eh, nah, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Wing Gemini would have been cool. I think, I think had the Air Force done some of these early space stations, these small labs in the, you know, pre-1964, if they would have committed to that as maybe a parallel program to the NASA Gemini, doing the, the Apollo technology, that might have, you know, led to some advancements pre-Skylab that would have made some real contributions to human factors, zero gravity research, uh, much earlier than it actually happened. So I think that was kind of a missed opportunity. The technology wasn't, you know, impossible to do. It was just that there was no money for those things. But I think that would have been a, a really interesting thing to do. And it might have, might have kept Gemini flying for a few years. Heck, look at look at the Russian Soyuz. It's been flying as long as Gemini. It flew at the same time Gemini did, and it's still flying. Who knows what would have happened? Good point. Well, thank you awesome. so much for joining awesome. us uh, to talk about uh, Gemini. I'm glad you say Gemini because uh, Emily keeps getting it wrong. I think I'm pronouncing it somewhere in between Gemini. <laughs> You know, it, I, I've seen that controversy. I don't have strong feelings on it. <laughs> it's one of the most contentious things about, about the program, isn't it? How do you pronounce it? <laughs> Why can't we just get along? That's, uh, that's my <laughs> better things to worry about or argue yeah. about. That's not yeah. one of them. <laughs> I worry about paying my bills. I'm not worried about, um, I'm not worried about the Gemini pronunciation. Gemini. <laughs> okay all right well thank you very much and uh yeah we'll hopefully speak to you again and uh well i'm sure we'll find plenty of other things to talk about at some point mike but thank you for joining us thanks dave thanks emily great being here um congratulations on your your long-term success again thanks thank you so much or mispronunciation is entertainment it's space and things so this is our second time with Mike, and both times I've really learned so much. I'm really looking forward to talk to him again. I'm sure we'll find uh, something else to talk about. I think it's really interesting what he said at the end about how the Russians are still flying the Soyuz spacecraft, which started flying around the same time as Gemini. And, and of course, while it's had some upgrades and uh, yeah, it had some tragedies as well in those early days, it's a spacecraft that works, so use it. And I feel like not using Gemini has perhaps been a missed opportunity. Uh, yes, there were issues with the, the stuck thruster on Gemini 8, which could have been a disaster had it not been for the calmness of Neil Armstrong. But ultimately, it was an incredibly successful program. And 
it seemed to be going from strength to strength. Of course, money's always an issue, but there have been long periods of time when flying a Gemini spacecraft could have filled a gap in human spaceflight for NASA, in my opinion, anyway. Anyway, it's, it is always great to talk to someone like Mike, who has so much knowledge. Yes, it is awesome. Um, Michael is really such a, a fount of knowledge when it comes to a lot of uh, stuff. He's really helped me a lot and also my uh, my Skylab type research. So, but yeah, it's awesome to hear about these uh, Gemini concepts, Gemini. mainly because that's a program that's just so underappreciated, but was so freaking cool. And it's cool to know that there's just more out there that they just didn't do. But it would have been cool to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know we did talk about the manned orbiting laboratory program, but what we didn't talk about was the fact that the Air Force actually had astronauts selected for that program. Yep. Some of them then got brought into the NASA program. For example, people like Bob Crippen, Carol Bobco, Gordon Fullerton, uh, Henry Hartsfield, Bob Overmyers, you know, that, that Richard Truly. Yep. You know, these are names that we know went on to become astronauts, but they were originally selected for the manned orbiting laboratory. And actually, the first African American to ever to be chosen to be an astronaut was also in that group, Major Robert Lawrence, who unfortunately passed away before yep. that group moved over into NASA once the manned orbiting laboratory yep. was cancelled. So the manned orbiting laboratory, as it was called back then, could have been a massive program if the Air Force had gone ahead with it. Anyway, I also loved the idea of the Wing Gemini, and there are some awesome photos of the mock-up, which was made of Big G on Mike's website as well. Uh, Mike's website's amazing. It's really comprehensive, and it's got many diagrams and reference notes, which are worth checking out. So, of course, it's in the show notes. Go look at it. It's really cool. And as always, you can hear the full unedited interview with Mike on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. To find out what guests are coming up in the future and submit your questions, head over to patreon.com forward slash space and things. So, Emily, what's caught your eye in spaceflight since last week? Uh, I'm probably missing a lot, but I got a uh, an email. It doesn't look embargoed or anything like that, but I got an email from ESA Media Relations yesterday about the re-entry of the Aeolus. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, Aeolus spacecraft. According to the press release, teams at ESA's Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany, are busy preparing to attempt a first-of-its-kind assisted re-entry. Now, the Aeolus spacecraft uh, was a wind mission. It was launched on August 22nd, 2018, and it's the first satellite. This is, and I'm reading this directly from the press release, uh, to acquire profiles of the Earth's wind on a global scale. It carried an instrument called the Aladdin, which was Europe's most sophisticated Doppler wind LIDAR flown in space. So that really sounds cool. So it's kind of sort of a weather satellite, if you will. A, a neat idea, you know, especially, you know, with monitoring uh, the environment. And ESA does a lot, just like NASA does. With an, um, They have a lot of environmental and, like, weather-type missions to basically monitor the Earth's condition. And I think people don't think a lot about that stuff. When you think of space, you think of, you know, people in space suits, you know, and things like that. And another facet of space exploration that's very important is to explore our own planet and to figure out, okay, what's happening with our weather patterns, what's happening with the wind, things like that. So really cool mission, but it is coming to an end. Uh, according to this press release, it's currently orbiting about 320 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Um, it has some remaining fuel, but this fuel is running out. And obviously, as we know, what comes up must come down. <laughs> so ESA and industry experts uh, apparently have demonstrated that the spacecraft can be re-entered through an assisted approach, which is semi-control. And again, according to the press release, this uh, attempt will try to reduce the very small. I, I want to add, you know, when a spacecraft re-enters, there's usually like a very one in a 10 billion risk it's gonna hurt somebody i don't want people coming from this podcast thinking they're gonna get hit by a satellite so they basically <laughs> ESA wants to reduce the risk of damage from any fragments that may survive you know the journey and, and reach the ground you know they don't want a uh, skylab 
hitting Esperance again, basically. So <laughs> they've come up with a series of commands, um, which for a period of a week will passivate. That's their words, the pa- the spacecraft, which basically means the spacecraft is going to gradually passivate. passivate. P-A-S-S-I-V-A-T-E. New word for me. That's, that's a word I've yep never heard of that one before, but brand new word. Try it. I'll try and use it in the next two days. Correct. Yeah, I'm gonna. That one's gonna <laughs> bust out in my language for a while. There's a, a word. One of my friends dropped a word a few days ago, and I've been using it ever since. Fortuitous. I've used it like 30 times. Steve is oh, like, that's a great word. Steve is like, I am sick of hearing this damn word, and I'm like, it's a beautiful <laughs> word, but yeah, it's an AP advanced placement English word. So passive. So basically what that means is they're going to sort of slowly or gradually, I should say, deactivate the spacecraft, deactivate its power systems, batteries, and they're going to attempt to direct it and any remaining fragments into the ocean. I'm not sure which sea it is. I'm sure time will tell what that is. It's sort of like a test almost to see, you know, okay, how can we best reenter our spacecraft? So we know we're going to get it into a safe spot where it's not going to hurt anybody or possibly pose a risk to anybody because there have been a few times in space history where spacecraft or satellites have deorbited and have hit, not people, thank God, but um, have hit the ground and, you know, you could actually recover parts of it. And I, I think the probably the most tragic example of this would be Columbia, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, when, of course. When that came down. But um, also Skylab, which, you know, had nobody on it, but it did hit parts of Australia pretty infamously. And um, there have been a few other, like, I, I think Russia had a Cosmos uh, spacecraft that came out in the 70s. And the problem with that one was it had nuclear fuel. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it, I think this came down over Canada. And it didn't hit anybody, but it actually, you could recover parts from it. I mean, it was that intact. So, um Anyway, this is sort of a, a means to, uh, you know, mitigate or find out how to mitigate that kind of thing happening. I think that's a really fascinating area of space flight to be studied, uh, basically how to bring spacecraft back down safely. You know, I, obviously, as space gets more populated, you know, debris is something we think about and we think about, you know, what's going to happen when this thing comes back down. You know, I know that NASA is doing studies about, obviously, about bringing the ISS back down eventually, which is an enormous object. I mean, that's going to be, when that thing comes back, it's going to be epic. I don't know where it's going to come down, but I'd like to come, I'd like to go see it whenever that happens. Hopefully I'll be pretty old. They've got to do it in bits, haven't they? They, they, They've got to break it down a bit. You'd you'd assume that that maybe that's part of the end of life of that station is they release some of the modules yeah. that, that were added later at later dates first. Maybe they separate the Russian and the American module, or may, if there's a way to do that, maybe they'll separate you know some of the individual modules from different countries. You know, who knows? And without people, obviously, aboard the spacecraft or very limited amounts of people aboard the spacecraft. I don't know. That's going to be nuts, but I'm sure NASA and their partners are are working on, okay, how are we going to do this at end of, you know, at the very end of life? So yeah, to me, yeah, that's fascinating. I love, I love reading about that, that kind of stuff. And I'm excited to see what will happen from this study. And I, I hope to keep following it. So, so what about you, Dave? What have you been looking at this week? The thing that story reminded me of it's not really the thing I've been looking at, but it certainly reminded me of, and it's a nice link to. Have you seen this thing that happened in Australia? Yeah, the thing that washed up on the beach. The it looks like a like a tank or a cylindrical a, a thing. Yeah, I have seen it's it. It's a part of a rocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's a little bit unsure exactly what it is, but uh, people are trying to figure out uh, what it might be, which is pretty cool. Something's basically something's washed up on the on the beach in Australia, which has a history of of getting hit and things washed up on the, on its shore yeah. so uh maybe it's just a good maybe it's got a big bullseye on from space yeah and people like aiming for for australia 
Uh, maybe it's just got a homing beacon or something like that. Maybe the hole in the ozone layer, which is near Australia, maybe that makes it easier for things to enter near the atmosphere then. Who knows? Anyway, there's a giant bit of spacecraft just landed on the beach by Australia, which is certainly interesting. But it's one of those weeks again where there's loads of cool stories that have happened. Again, I will put links for all of these because we're gonna I'm gonna gloss over them. We had the announcement of the next Virgin Galactic yes. launch, which is gonna take place on August 11th, and that crew, which is pretty cool. And there's a there's someone who won two tickets in a prize draw, which I just love. They're from the Caribbean, and I just love the fact that two people who won tickets to space in a prize draw. That's the world we're living in now. Raffle prize. <laughs> <laughs> Go <Yeah>. to space. <laughs> See, I think it's crazy. That's, that's cool. That's really neat. So, and I think she's going with her daughter as well. Daughter, yeah, it's a mother and daughter, which is yeah, which is really lovely. I hope that goes very well. Yeah, me too. I'm a, I was a little worried about it when I heard that because I was like, man, that's that's. I don't know if I would want, like, I love my niece, but I don't know if I'd want to go to space with her because I'm very like, I'd be like, just stay on the ground. Because I love you, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I don't want you to get hurt. But yeah, that's really cool. And I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that'll be the first mother and daughter, the first parent child in space, if I'm not mistaken. Together at the same time. Didn't that happen on a, on a Blue Origin? It may have. Okay. It may have happened already. But still, that's really... It was definitely family members. Yeah. That's, different generation. I may have been may have been nephew, but I'm yeah. pretty sure it was, was father and son. That but is anyway. really crazy, though. That's really crazy that that's happening now. Absolutely, uh, and of course, there's plenty to be discussed in that in terms of safety and, and are yeah. we ready for these kind of things? And are we setting ourselves up for for failure and and this kind of? Are we ready for 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 something going wrong on these kind of missions? Yeah, and that's a whole other conversation to be had at, at certain a certain time. But yeah, still, it's it, when these things get announced, it's still to me, it's still a fair amount of novelty and. Said the fact that it's a prize draw winner it just adds to the the craziness of this. Um, so India launched uh, a moon rover uh, this week as well. I don't know if you saw that um, called the, the Chandrayaan three. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's how I'm saying it. Chandrayaan. And if they successfully land, they'll be the fourth nation to successfully do a soft landing on the wow. moon. So hopefully, it's it's been it's. Certainly proven difficult for some people recently, but uh, maybe we should know by the end of August whether that's uh, that's on the moon and, and exploring the moon, which is pretty cool. Talking of the moon, China have uh, announced how they intend on getting to the moon by 2030. Uh, they're, they're planning on getting some humans on the moon, which will be fun. Uh, but yeah, by 2030. And they've announced the plans, how they're going to do it, what, what they're going to use, what their methodology is. They're going to have two spacecraft go up separately and rendezvous around the moon, I think, is the plan. Also in China, there was the first ever methane fueled rocket reach orbit this week. Uh, the Zhuk-2, again, probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but Z-H-U-Q-U-E, which would be a great scoring word on Scrabble. Anyway, <laughs> that's uh, been developed by Landspace, and uh, methane fuel is, well, it, it burns a pretty blue colour, which is is nice. It's being touted as being more environmentally friendly than uh, kerosene, the standard RP1, which is used in many rockets. So hopefully this will, this will do some good uh, in, in uh, making companies try and think outside the box in, in terms of what we were talking about last week, the uh, Astra Carta, and, and how the space industry is, is working on the environment and making sure that it's Doing as much as possible to to not cause more problems. Yeah. Uh, also, did you see the new Astro Van, which is going to be used for the Artemis astronauts? For the I have r- r- that's been released. It's such a weird looking thing, isn't it? Yeah, I've gotten a few messages from people like, "Man, that thing is ugly. They need to take it back to the <laughs> the Apollo days and use that one." And I'm like, uh, "I don't know that one." It- I think is in a museum now, but still, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're kind of funky looking. That, yeah, they're not. They're a little goofy looking, but that's okay. I mean, uh, are they electric? I think they're electric. I think I well, yeah, I think they are electric. Yeah, they're certainly. You're right. They're certainly funny looking, aren't they? Yeah, they're a little goofy looking. It's it's, it's nice that we see this kind of stuff. It keeps the 
the the momentum going towards Artemis too is it is it hopefully will happen next year. Also, while we're talking about Artemis, ESA, the head of ESA has said that there will definitely be a European national on Artemis four and five. I don't know why I thought there was going to be one and three, but he's announced there's definitely going to be an, a European national on Artemis four and five, and they've not yet picked who that's going to be, but still pretty cool. And uh, did you also finally from from me? The Vulcan rocket that ULA are planning on launching has been delayed. I don't know if you saw this because of uh, the, a Blue Origin that they are providing the engines for this. And one of them exploded in a test yeah. at the end of June, which is pretty crazy. So uh, that's a bit of a shame that that's had a setback. But let's hopefully that they, they figured out what that problem was and get it fixed because exploding engines is definitely not what we want to see. Yeah. And um, ULA has a really good culture of testing. They, they're one of those companies, they don't fly until it's top. I mean, they're just not going to do it until yeah. it's 100, until they are assured, you know, okay, we're about as ready as we can possibly be to do this. And if you follow like their, yeah. you know, Tori Bruno on, on Twitter or whatever, I hopefully he's on threads now, but they have a really great culture of testing and they're absolutely not going to probably fly Vulcan until they've worked out any of the issues with the, the Centaur 5. And the and the blue origin, you know, the engine. So and and hey, more power to them. You know, I I personally would rather see it fly when it's a hundred percent ready versus you know, I understand the Starship thing was a test, but that was not ready to fly. <laughs> yeah, I understand that was a test, but in the same vein, you know, ULA doesn't do that kind of stuff. You know, they they're more risk averse and it's just a different methodology, correct. isn't it? It's a different idea of how to how to go about it. There's arguments for and against both methods, aren't there? I'm not saying it's better or worse or anything. I, 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 you know, I really don't want to cause a social media fight, but at the same vein, you know, ULA isn't going to fly it until they know it's ready. So more power to them. And uh, I personally plan on being at the first Vulcan Centaur launch because a, a Celestis payload is on it. So I plan on being there. Nice. And whenever it's ready, I'll be there. So as always... There will be links in the show notes to everything we've just spoken about. So if anything that we just glossed over caught your attention, check out our show notes. The full show notes are always on our website. So there's always a link wherever you listen to this podcast. There should be a link in that description to the full show notes of that episode. If it's the current week, it will just be on the front page of our website. If not, there'll be a different link in the show notes that you can click on that will take you straight to that page in the archives or you can just search the archives on our website which is spaceandthingspodcast.com Bringing you a new episode every Thursday since September 2020 This is Space and Things Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the share button and consider joining us over on Patreon if you haven't already. A big thank you to Mick Bremner for doing just that in the last week. If anyone else wants to join us over there, then head to patreon.com forward slash space and things. Thanks, Mick. And thanks to all who continue to support us, whether that's financially or otherwise. We'll be back next week. So hopefully you've already subscribed on your podcast app so that you won't miss it. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you meet. You've been listening to the Space and Things podcast.